Which players on the Tennessee Titans are facing a make or break season for their careers in 2024? We're gonna dive into the list and tell you why. This is the Music City Audible, let's get to it. Oh, welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver. With me, as always, Justin Mello from vacation somewhere. Justin, how is it going? (laughs) Yeah, I'm just off for the week. Just really happy to be taking some time to recharge the batteries because the NFL draft season was a long one. Uh, If you're watching this, I didn't go anywhere special, do anything like that, but just sort of recharging the batteries. Uh, so nice to be away from my desk for, this will be the first time I can't tell you in how long I will actually not write a single thing this week. <laughs> Nothing. I, I, it's going to look like I did because I wrote so much content last week <laughs> and prep for this week. So basically I worked double time in order to take a week off, but uh, it's still going to feel, I'll be tweeting all the stories that are, a lot of Titan stuff actually I've got coming uh, this week. But if you're, if you're not familiar, uh, I didn't even really make a proper announcement, but I am now in charge of Titan Sized. That is the fan-sided page for the Tennessee Titans. Uh, It was a a great opportunity. They they headhunted me, and I'm so thankful to them for this opportunity. I'm in charge of Titan Sized. I promise to make that site a lot better than it's been, right? That's what I told them in my job interview. That's the honest truth. I got so much content coming there this week. Unfortunately, a lot of my... I'm sorry? Shots fired. No, no, no. It's just like, (laughs) hey, it's got to be better. It it is what it is, and... uh, uh, I've got a lot of content coming there. So some of my content has shifted away from Broadway as a result, but I'm not going anywhere. I love those people too much. So still be popping by there on on occasion. Uh, but most of my Titans content is going to be on Titan size moving forward, my written content. So I've got a lot of stories to tweet out this week from the <laughs> new platform, but I am not writing, not a single one of them was written this week. Just know that. Yeah, exactly. Neither was this. This was not recorded this week either. Yeah, sorry. We uh, pre-recorded this episode not to be disingenuous with our listeners. Full disclosure, this was recorded last week. But anyway, let's get into it, Justin. Make or break players. We got guys like Traylon Burks, Dylan Radins, Rashad Weaver, and a whole list for you we're going to get into. But first, let me ask you, are you listening to this podcast on a podcast platform or are you watching our faces on YouTube? We got new graphics and we got lower third topic bars now on our videos and I'm really proud of the way the show looks. So you should be tuning in to YouTube. Make sure you're subscribed to the Music City Audible channel. Give this video a like, thumbs up, turn on channel alerts so you can get a notification every time we drop a new video. And the best way to help this channel grow is to comment, comment, comment on every video, boosting the algorithm. We see you guys out there. We really appreciate those comments that just say boosting the algorithm. Love that. (laughs) Um, But if you want to join the conversation, let us know below who is your make or break player for the Titans in 2024. Not who's going to make or break the Titan season, but which players are in their own make or break season for their careers. Player or players, let us know in the comments. And we want to shout out our sponsor for this episode, Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville, Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. Sinkers Beverages, the premier wine, spirits, and beer store in East Nashville, serving the community since 1985. Their knowledgeable staff is proud to help you with large parties, themed events, or finding something unique for a special occasion. From birthday parties to milestone celebrations to everyday moments, Sinkers can help with the right drink for every occasion. If you head to sinkersbeverages.com or check the link in this podcast description, you can join the in-crowd. In-crowd members get access to allocated wines and spirits, exclusive events, early access to barrel releases, and more. So check out sinkersbeverages.com today. All right, Justin, make or break players. I teased a few of the names there at the top. Let's just dive right into the list, starting with wide receiver Traylon Burks. First of all, tell me why this is a make or break year for Burks, and then we'll discuss more what that looks like for him, given the role that he'll be in this season as the presumptive wide receiver for. Well, first of all, this topic uh, came to our minds based on an article I wrote on the Draft Network. I had to pick one Titans player. I did it for all 32 teams, make or break. I chose Traylon Burks for the Titans. But then as you and I got into a discussion, uh, it became a really good uh, topic to sort of flesh out for this episode because there are a lot of players in our opinion that are in make or break years. Yeah. It starts with Traylon Burks. As you said, this is a tough one, right? Cause look, it's very obvious. Uh, the short version of it hasn't met expectations, right? First year got off to the, on the wrong foot. There was the whole asthma stuff, Nashville, couldn't, Nashville, he couldn't stay on the field. And then he ends up on IR like week four or five with turf toe, not a good rookie year, right? We go into the sophomore season uh, oh my God, he's making all these plays in training camp, OTAs, what a breakout year coming. He's got the knee injury in like a late August joint practice with the Vikings. 
Uh, I don't even know if I want to blame that because I, I just think the offseason hype just didn't translate to on-field yep. results. It somehow got worse than the rookie year. Like the numbers took a nosedive, less receptions, less receiving yards, less everything from him in 2023. New regime comes in, says no way in hell we're relying on this guy. I'm sorry. That's what they said, right? You don't pay Calvin Ridley what you paid him. And then you bring in Tyler Boyd, a team friendly deal, but it's clear that you didn't trust this guy to be a top three receiving option. This sets up a really interesting season for him, in my opinion, because as my article sort of stated, um, he's probably not going to get a lot of opportunity this year unless there's injuries. And we hope that's not the case, obviously. Right. So I think what he's got to do this offseason this summer is make sure he's capable of backing up DeAndre Hopkins at X, Calvin Ridley at Z and Tyler Boyd in the slot. Yeah, That's the pathway to getting him on the field. And of course, there's going to be some rotation, some packages, maybe a design deep shot for him, yada, yada, design screen, whatever. But if you know actual tangible opportunities, routine recurring opportunities, they will only arrive more than likely if he can play all three positions. That's right. how he can put himself in the best position. And it's so interesting. I'm going to throw it back to you that you look like you want to cut it. Yeah. I've got more to say, but I'll throw it back to you. It's a really interesting uh, dilemma he finds himself in. Well, I have a point on that because there's this big assumption that like, oh, Traylon Burks is wide receiver for... And this is something I didn't really account for. I did my Titans 2024 stat projections. If you missed that video, go back in the feed and find it. I'm pretty proud of the work I did for that. But something I didn't account for in that stat projection and something that most fans I don't think are accounting for at all, the Titans have a very top-heavy trio of wide receivers that are going to play a lot, that are going to be the main targets for this offense. But that is the oldest receiving room in the NFL by average age right now. Those guys are not going to be able to play 90, 95% of snaps like you would see a 22 year old receiver doing like you would see a Justin Jefferson doing who when healthy plays the majority of snaps or, you know, you pick any receiver in the league who's under the age of 25, they're playing the majority of the snaps on their offense. Well, the receivers that are 29, 30, 31 years old, those guys are going to have to take a little bit more rest to keep their bodies in peak physical condition to last through the course of an 18 game, 18 week season, 17 game, 18 week season. So I think that there will be more opportunity for Traylon Burks than we think, just because I think the Titans receivers are going to rotate a little more often than the typical wide receiver room in the NFL, just given their age and the desire to preserve them for the course of that season so that they can still be healthy if this team is competing for a playoff spot. So I think that speaks to your point that Burks is going to be able to rotate, going to need to be able to rotate into whichever position, which whoever needs a breather, whether it's Hopkins or Ridley or Boyd, Burks has got to be able to come in and say, I know exactly what to do in that alignment from that spot, from that receiver spot. Where where do I need to be in this offense? So Traylon Burks played slot in college most of his snaps. He played a little bit on the outside, but majority in college, he was a slot receiver. So he should be able to pick that up when it comes to you know backing up Tyler Boyd. He has played X for the majority of his time in the NFL so far. So he should be able to pick up that spot. And he has had plays where he's the motion man, where he's the detached receiver like a Z receiver would be, that you think he should be able to come in and pick that up. So it's all going to be on the mental side because he's done all of it physically on the field at some point in his life. It's going to be if he can pick up Brian Callahan's offense mentally and be able to back up all those spots. Because if not, you know, they're still going to rotate a lot of guys. It's just, is it going to be Burks that's rotating in frequently? Or if they can't trust him to know the offense, it's going to be Nick westbrook Akina rotating in. It's going to be someone else in the right. slot, whether it's rookie Jaquan Jackson or Kyle Phillips or even, I don't know, Mason Kinsey. But they have bodies there. Kiaris Jackson was a, you know, standout performer last preseason before he got hurt. So there are options for the Titans. It's up to Traylon Burks to prove that he's the best option, I feel like. Yeah. That's a great point, and I'm glad you said it because I was kind of going in that direction. I wasn't going to say all you said, so I'm glad you said it. But I'm going to build on that point uh, by adding. It, it's ironic because uh, you talked about the age of this room. It's almost like if he does well, Traylon Burks, this year in a limited opportunity, with limited opportunities, but being able to play all those roles, if he does well, then he could have a bigger role in 2025 than he has right. in 2024. And that's ironic. But DeAndre Hopkins is on the final year of his contract. Tyler Boyd's on a one-year deal. I don't necessarily know that either of those guys are back in 2025. In fact, 
If I was a betting man, I'd say they're not. Neither of them is back. Right. That and leaves them with Calvin Ridley and really nothing else. And Burns and is going to be under contract. And T. Higgins important. and T. Higgins on a thirty million dollar a year deal, right? That's how the well, future plays out. I'm not out. as convinced. I know you say that in jest and you're laughing, but are they going to pay T. Higgins thirty million when they're paying Calvin Ridley twenty twenty two? It's it's a possibility. We know how much Callahan likes receivers, and Miami just did it with Waddle right. and Hill. But I'm not convinced the Titans will. Well, they they might, but. The point is, right now, Calvin Ridley's the only one under contract in 2025. And who else? Traylon Burks, right? Like, And you're not going to cut him. Just correct me if I'm wrong. But even as a first rounder, like, uh, there's financial. That's why I haven't yeah. cut Caleb Farley, right? Like, there's financial penalty involved with cutting a first rounder. They could trade him, you know, TPD. But uh, right now, you keep him under contract in 2025. It's a, it's a team-friendly number. Uh, you're probably going to you're gonna decline the 50-year option, making that a contract year. But if he does well with limited opportunity this year, maybe they say they're, they're still going to have to acquire at least one good receiver next offseason. But maybe they'll do what they didn't do this offseason and say, hey, you know what? We can trust him to be a top three. We don't need to go out and get a Calvin Ridley and a Tyler Boyd. Let's go out and get one of them and, and, and trust Burks to fill out the rest. So. I think we're going to move on to the next Wait, player. I got one more point. That essentially sums up what, what he's facing. Here. Yeah, I got one more point to make before we move on, and that is just to, to you know close the book on the idea that he could be cut. He will not be cut. This year, no. if he's cut, $8 million dead cap, $8.5 million dead cap hit for just a $4 million actual cap hit. So there's no chance they cut him ahead of this offseason or ahead of this season. And there's really a very minimal chance they cut him next season because he has a cap hit of $4.5 million. If they cut him... Before the 2025 season starts, it's a $4.5 million dead cap. So it's literally the same amount to keep him on your roster as it is to cut him from your roster. No chance that you would just let him go unless they find themselves with a random abundance of riches at wide receiver. I'm very, very, very unlikely. I do think there's a chance he could still be traded. Even this offseason, he could still be traded. Me too. But you're not going to get a lot for him. So you'd have to be comfortable saying, all right, we'll take a conditional sixth round pick or maybe seventh round pick, seventh round pick swap type of deal to get Traylon Burks off our roster. Other than that, I can't really see a, a way that he's not on. I think ultimately the trade speculation because the Titans signed Calvin Ridley because the Titans signed Tyler Boyd, there was a lot of trade speculation in the media. I think that was a little overblown. I think the Titans would love to have Traylon Burks. And the very last point I'll make is this is not Mike Vrabel's offense. This is not a run the ball heavily 58% of your snaps, 60% of your snaps running the ball. This is going to be the opposite. It's going to be passing on 55 to 60 percent of snaps maybe 61 percent of snaps when brian callahan was on as a coordinator in cincinnati over those five years they passed over 60 percent of offensive snaps so this is going to be a pass happy offense and a pass friendly offense that has those quick reads for wide receivers has those you know the cornerbacks lined up 10 yards off the line of scrimmage we have an adjustment where we're just going to snap it and hit the outside receiver immediately and make allow him to try to get some yards after catch even if he gets only five yards on first and 10, that's like a successful run play, right? So those plays are going to be baked into this offense. And I think that's going to help Traylon Burks. There is a chance based on the fact that he's wide receiver four, that his role is just going to be run and take the top off the defense. And if you're open or the safeties shift a certain way, we'll take the shot. But I do think for the most part, they're going to make life easier on Traylon Burks. And the other thing we're not even thinking about is... uh. What if somebody gets hurt? <laughs> Traylon Burks could have a lot of snaps if somebody gets hurt. These are older receivers on the Titans roster. So there is an even more chance for him to make, you know, make to prove himself in this make or break year if other things go wrong for the rest of the roster. So, yes, we can move on now. I just want to make those last two points. And let's talk about Dylan Radins, who is in the final year of his rookie contract. Why is it a make or break year for Dylan Radins? Well, it's, first of all, he hasn't lived up to his expectations as a second round pick in 2021, I believe it was. Um, now he finds himself in the final year. It was the previous GM that took him, John Robinson, previous head coach, of course, Mike Vrabel. Uh, now you've got Callie and you've got Rand Carthon here. And they're supposedly, uh, so we think, going to put Dylan Ray into a three-man competition at right guard. We've talked about this a little on a recent episode where we talked about what's happening at OTAs on right guard and right tackle. Uh, it's going to be Dylan Radins for Saadi Charles and Daniel Brunskill at right guard. Uh, to my knowledge, I think he's going to be uh, in third place of those three guys, at least to wow. start, you know, mandatory minicamp rookie, uh, 
rookie, excuse me, mandatory mini camp, training camp in mid mid to late July, whenever it marks its arrival. I don't even think we have a date yet. But, we do not. Um, I, I think he's going to start in third place there. But, you know, again, we said it, the guy, don't want to be redundant. The guy's in front of him. He, it's not like he's up against one of the, he's not up against Quentin Nelson here, right? Like, <laughs> right. He's up against Sadi Charles and Daniel Brunskill. So there's wiggle room for him to go out there and play better and practice better than both of them and catapult himself maybe to the top of that list. He played some right guard for them last year, uh, more or less guard because of Skaronsky being out of the lineup. I thought he played okay at left guard. I thought he played pretty decent at right tackle, played a lot more right tackle last year. Again, I guess, you know, Chris Hubbard got hurt and who, who can't, I don't even remember Nick Petit Friere got hurt, like Dillard was a mess. Ended up playing a lot of right tackles towards the end of the year. And he was, Pretty good. He was pretty okay, at least. I think pretty okay is at least a fair way to put it. Uh, but to our knowledge, I, I, I don't think he's going to be in that mix at right tackle from right. what we've heard this offseason. So it's a make or break year. Maybe it's already too far gone, right? It's very clear this was a second round pick that didn't uh, f- meet expectations. But I do think there is a, uh, a, a universe out there within the realm of possibility uh, that he ends up starting you know, at one of those positions and plays okay. And yeah. even gets an extension. Yeah. Wouldn't that be quite the comeback story? Right? I mean, like, if gets he... resigned. he's not going to be expensive, even if he has a good year, I don't think he's going to be that expensive because it's one year out of four. Right. But, uh, but that's his hope, right? That's what he's got to strive for. The factors working in his favor. Some of them you said already, I'll, I'll mention them again. There's no lock to start at right guard. The competition there, it's wide open. So he has every chance to seize that opportunity He's now being coached by Bill Callahan. The yeah. we've talked about. We did our you know last week, a week ago today. We did the episode deep diving into Bill Callahan's impact. And I think a lot of people forget what kind of athlete Dylan Radins was coming out of college. This is a guy who was a nine point three eight RAS score, 69th out of eleven hundred and three tackles, not guards. Tackles are you know. Traditionally more athletic, it requires more athleticism to play tackle than it does to play guard. So you're talking about 69th out of 1,100 offensive tackles. Where would that rank in the out of guards? I'm not even sure. I'd have to go do a little more research maybe. But uh, the point is, this guy's an athlete. I mean, he is a good athlete. He's got the physical traits to succeed. Now he's being coached by Bill Callahan. He's got better physical traits than the other guys competing for the right guard job, Daniel Brunskill and Sadiq Charles. He is the best athlete of that group. Um, the question is, like, does he fit Bill Callahan's size? He was a 6'5", 300-pound guy coming out of college, not a 320, not a 340, 100-pound guy. So maybe a little undersized for what Bill Callahan likes in that position. They, they, uh, Brian Callahan talked to the media the other day about what Lloyd Cushenberry brings to the offense and talked about how when you have huge people in the middle of the offensive line, it makes it harder to collapse the pocket. Yeah. There's nothing Bingo. you can do to chip or help those guys. You know, those guys just got to hold their own. And if the pocket collapses, there's nowhere for the quarterback to go. So he seemed to think it was very important to have big beefy guys in the middle of that offensive line, particularly. So is Dylan Radins fit that profile to, to start at right guard? I don't know. But even if somebody gets hurt this year, whoever starts at right guard, if it's not Raidens, injuries happen all the time. Raidens will still probably get a chance to play some snaps and prove whether or not he can be a guy they can rely on. Maybe could win the job for the last half of the year that way. There are paths to him reclaiming his spot as, you know, a second round guy with a high potential. I don't know if it's going to happen, but it is 100% make or break because if he doesn't make it this year, He's not going to be on the Titans next year, and he's probably, you know, a journeyman at best career backup from there if if it doesn't work out this season. Agreed. Agreed. I've got nothing to add in truth. I think you covered it nicely there. We're going to move on to Rashad Weaver, who this is another interesting one because another guy, 2021 draft pick, fourth rounder, who's entering the final year of his contract. Well, I, I think for the most part, we know what Rashad Weaver is. So, Justin and Justin, why did you even put him on the list? Well, it's because, you know, we're looking at this depth chart, and uh, and hopefully this episode doesn't age like milk because they they could sign someone between the recording and release of this episode. But looking at the depth chart, Titans are going to play Rashad Weaver a fair bit in 2024, right? Like, they've got Harold Landry. We've talked about the need at this position, but to to, kind of recalibrate here, they've got Harold Landry and Arden Key at outside linebacker, not a lot else. Right, like they, they yeah. lose Dina Kawatri uh, in free agency. They don't draft one until this their final pick, seventh round. Jalen Harrell 
you know, Sebastian Joseph Day and Marlon Davidson, Devondre Sweat, obviously none of those guys are going to play that position on the outside with any sort of frequency. Uh, that puts Rashad Weaver in line for a pretty important role. Your number three edge, number one rotational guy. So going into a contract year, if that is the case, that gives him an opportunity to play a fair amount of football. Can I totally go off topic here and reference something we talked about on our last podcast? Absolutely. Jojo Doman, still on the roster. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you just brought that up. He's not Based listed the, uh, as an inside linebacker. He's listed backing up Thomas Rush, who's backing up Rashad Weaver, who's backing up Harold Landry. So he's got they got him listed as an outside linebacker on this yeah, he's ESPN not depth he's chart. An inside guy. And he's 100% an inside guy. So forgive me earlier this week when I said Jojo Doman not on the roster anymore and you accepted that as fact. Not true. So Jojo Doman in the mix was, for it. Edge. I thought he was. <laughs> anyway, um, back to the topic at hand, Rashad Weaver. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think unless Caleb Murphy, the UDFA from last year, takes a huge leap forward, That's there's huge. almost no competition for your third edge rusher. Now, they could still sign somebody. There are veterans out there. There's guys that, you know, Brian Callahan worked with out there in Carl Lawson and, and other people like that. So there is a chance that they still sign an edge here heading into training camp. But barring that, I mean, it's the UDFAs from last year, Caleb Murphy, Thomas Rush. It's a seventh-round pick from this year, Jalen Harrell. Like, it's Marlon Davidson if you think he can bump outside to edge maybe on early downs. But, like, as far as true outside linebackers go, in the same sort of mold of Harold Landry and Arden Key, Rashad Weaver is, like, the only guy – in the room. So he not only does he have to be good this year to prolong his NFL career, he's got to be good this year for the Titans defense to have success when Harold Landry and Arden Key need a breather. So he's got to be able to set the edge on early downs, which I think is what he's better at than just pure pass rush and getting after the quarterback. Although he had some moments and he's had some moments in his career where you're like, damn, if he can pull that move out, why doesn't he do that more often? Like he's had some nice pass rush moves in his career. He's had some nice time job getting to the quarterback, knocking the football out, forcing fumbles. He's just got to do it way more consistently. So I think you're, you're spot on putting him on this list here because again, final year of his rookie contract, the Titans don't like we mentioned a, a few episodes ago, if you had to project their number one pick right now for the 2025 draft, you're picking it edge or right tackle. Rashad Weaver has a chance to quiet down that noise about the need at edge if he can solidify himself here. I don't think he's going to do it. I'll just be frank. <laughs> I think Rashad Weaver is a fine rotational player, but he's never going to prove himself to be like a reliable starter. And I don't even think he's that fine of a rotational rusher. He's more like a rotational early down run edge setter than he is edge rusher. Um, that's where I think he's at, but I definitely agree it's a make or break year for him. Well, I agree with you. I, I don't have a lot of faith that he's going to go and, you know, ha have a great year and see this opportunity. But the point is, again, us being fair, not letting our evaluation kind of creep into the topic, so to speak. It's that if he is the edge three, which it looks like he is, then he's going to have every opportunity to make this a make, not break year for him. Right. Agreed. So as long as he's got opportunity, the rest is up to him. It's up to you and I to sort of project what that opportunity might look like. Uh, he'll decide the results. But as of now, it looks like opportunity is going to be present. And basically every guy on this list that we're going through, I think every guy on this list was drafted by John Robinson, right? Are we even going to talk all about them. Yeah, every anyone that wasn't? Yeah. So all these guys were either signed as a UDFA. Actually, no, they were all drafted. Every guy on this list was drafted, drafted by John Robinson. So that just adds to the make or break status of it is like, you got to prove to a new GM and a new coaching staff that you still belong on this team. And the next guy that that applies to, Nicholas Petit Frere. And this is the last, like, true make or break. The rest of them are sort of debatable. Um, but this one, for sure, NPF. If he doesn't win the right tackle job at a training camp, I feel like his time in Tennessee is over. His time as an NFL player may be over just because of the scandal that already happened to him. Like, he's got some baggage off field stuff. Not that it was a big deal. It was gambling. It's not like he was a criminal or anything like that. And and what he and keep in mind, and I you know no everyone listens to the show knows I don't like the player, Nicholas Petit Friere, uh, as a player, but the, the it was so ridiculous, right? Like he got caught gambling on like a college basketball game in like a team hotel and he did like 
to be fair, what a crazy rule. Like he knew what the rules were. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to gamble in the building. Well, apparently team hotels, when you're staying in hotels considered the building, which is ridiculous. So yeah. Okay. So fair mind. enough. I was a little hard on him there, but I just yeah. feel like based on his play on the field too, like if he doesn't put it all together under Bill Callahan's oh, yeah. tutelage this year, that's it. He's going to be a journeyman signed for league minimum to come compete in yes. camp for the rest of his life. I, I don't think his NFL career will be over because, uh, uh, I think like Dennis Daly and LaRaven Clark are still in the NFL, right? <laughs> fair, it's just really enough. hard to find guys that could even play yeah. offensive tackle. He'll, he'll, he'll play in the NFL for years to come in my opinion, but this is curtains for him for sure. If he doesn't win the right tackle job in terms of having a chance to be a starter, having a chance to make, you know, the life changing money in this league and all of those things, because, uh, He's quite honest. He's very fortunate. They don't have a better option at right tackle. Like I, I, I can't believe that in year <laughs> three for him, when he's shown nothing in really year one or two, and I get a lot of pushback year one, he was okay. He was, I, I disagree. I thought he was below average. I get third round rookie. You lower your expectations. You could convince yourself that he was okay. But uh, what he's shown in two years He's very fortunate that they didn't upgrade this position this summer, that he, he he even has a chance to win this job. And not only a chance, he's probably the front runner, as you and I have said. So he's lucky to have this opportunity. It's it's him to take it by the horns. And what I just said about Dylan Radins being an athlete that we forget how athletic he is and all that does not apply to Nicholas petit <laughs> Nicholas petit is 6.51 RIS coming out of the combine. That was 401st out of 1,100 offensive tackles. So way lower than Dylan Radins and just, you know, average to above average athleticism score there. He's not somebody that has particularly special traits as an athlete, but he gets to, this is the best opportunity he's ever going to have. The right tackle job, just like the right guard job is wide open in terms of competition. He's got Bill Callahan teaching him the ropes. It's going to be an offense that is friendly for the offensive line. We talked about this when we went to the Bill Callahan deep dive, but Brian Callahan's offense has mitigated poor offensive line play over the time that he was in Cincinnati. He knows how to run an offense that gets the ball out quick, that helps those offensive linemen. If they need to, you hope that J.C. Latham can hit the ground running and hold his own on the left side on an island so that all that help can go to the right side and, again, further help that right tackle out. So, again, this is just the best chance NPF is ever going to have to seize control of the job and prove that he belongs as a starter in the NFL. And I'll go further to say we talked because we I'm going mean, to use Dylan Radins because we talked about him. There is less in NPF's way than there is in Dylan's Radins's way. Like I think Daniel Brunskill and Saudi Charles are probably better NFLers right now than anyone that's pushing. Like we're talking about Jalen Duncan, John Joku, Leroy Watson, like Brunskill and Saudi Charles are more experienced, you know, better results to date than any of those guys. So right. there's pretty little, you know, standing in Petit Freer's way here. It's Jalen Duncan, honestly, and probably nothing else. Yeah. And it's like if the Titans go sign a veteran free agent tackle, that would provide the most resistance and it here. Changes. And, that, and that could happen and that would change things. But I think for now, you almost have to pencil in NPF as the starter for day one and just like kind of hope that he's good enough to be that guy. And for him, it's absolutely a make or break year. All right, we can go quickly, quicker, I guess, through the last five guys, six guys Agreed. still on this list. We're going to go quicker. Um, the next guy on the list is quarterback Malik Willis. And I don't even know that this really applies because he's already been bumped down to QB3, right? Like they paid Mason Rudolph pretty good money to come be the backup quarterback. Mason Rudolph has proven that he's able to go win a few games if pressed into action. They have all but handed the reins over to Will Levis, like... Brian Callahan's out there doing interviews with Albert Breer and Monday morning quarterback talking about how important it is for Will Levis to come into this building, knowing that he's the starting quarterback for the entire team to come into the building, knowing that it's Will Levis's job, just the, the presence that that gives him as the team starting quarterback when he doesn't have to compete for it. And Brian Callahan talked about how even having like a fake competition just to like make the guy quote unquote, earn the job can be detrimental to their development. So yeah, I love Brian absolutely. Callahan's attitude towards that. All that to say, Malik Willis is the clear quarterback three. He doesn't really have a snowball's chance in hell to win the backup quarterback job over Mason Rudolph. Yeah. So is it a make or break year from that standpoint? Like, is he even going to see action this year? Well, it would have to be a disaster for him to even take the field this year, right? Agreed. And you don't even have to say any of the stuff about Will Levis. It's so obvious, but... You're right. He's the number three. When I say major break, what you said about NPF, 
this guy could be out of the league. Yeah. If things don't okay. look improved in all honesty, right? Like he might be out of the NFL because, uh, uh, number one, Brian Callahan during the combine, I think it was, you know what I'm going to say, talked about the requirements he was looking for in a backup quarterback. All our alarm bells went off me to say, that doesn't sound like Malik Willis. Right. Then they went out and signed Mason Rudolph, made it very clear that we were right. It was not Malik Willis, right? What he was looking for in a backup quarterback. So, uh, you know, I, I went back and forth was like, is he going to be on the 53? Right. right. Like that's the make or break for him. And initially I thought, yeah, you know, remember there's that new quarterback three rule with the emergency. He doesn't have to be active. Like it's helping more quarterback threes keep their job. That's the baseline point I'm going to make. But Mike Herndon, our pal, uh, he just released a really good article on Polkoharski.com. I guess it's a week ago now, 53 man roster projection. He made a really good point that that rule was already in effect last year. And the Bengals, Brian Callahan, did not keep three quarterbacks on the 53. And that was with Joe Burrow being hurt, you know, throughout the summer. So interesting point. I was leaning Willis makes it. Now I'm second guessing it because Mike made a good point. And by the way, I was pissed off that Mike wrote the 53 man roster roster projection, excuse me, because I'm working on my own. I love doing it this time of year, like that lull of training camp before training camp. That is and OTAs are essentially ending and you were going to have mandatory mini camp soon here, uh, or actually it might've already started by the time you listen to this episode. But uh, I, I love doing a 53 man roster projection at this time of year. I'm going to do one anyway. Sounds like back and forth. Sounds like we should have Mike on this podcast to debate with you and do a real time 53 man roster projection. Let's see if it's we can not make a, that it's happen. Not a bad idea. Because I love you know that what? Idea. I, I, I'm, I'm going to have mine out mid June. As you know, I'm taking. I'm not freaking writing anything this week. I'm going <laughs> to have mine out mid June. <laughs> Uh, June 14, 15 ish, probably when you can expect it roughly. And I already know I'm going to have several changes from Mike's 53 because there are things as soon as I was reading, I disagreed with no one's 53 should ever be exactly the same, especially this time of year. But uh, that's the debate on Malik is, is he on the 53? Is he still in the NFL in 2025? That's what makes it make or break for him. He's got to show up as an improved version of himself. We know he's going to be QB3, but he's at least got to prove capable of that and being able to show growth from some of the deficiencies he had as a rookie and sophomore. I know we're trying to move quicker. I got one more point to make on this, and that's that, <laughs> and that's that the emergency quarterback rule is great and everything, but if you end up in a situation where Malik Willis is – like, let's say it's they don't have to go to him in a game. So you don't have the emergency quarterback rule, right? But Will Levis gets hurt at some point and Mason Ruff's your starter. And now you're relying on Malik Willis as your backup. Like, is it worth keeping him on the 53-man roster because he knows the offense versus the talent drop-off of, like, just signing somebody off of somebody's practice squad? Like, I almost feel like you could do better than Malik Willis at quarterback three just from picking off practice squads. And there's always so many veterans on practice squads. Yeah, like squads look what the Browns like, did with Joe Flacco. <clears throat> yeah, like you don't worry about them coming in and having to pick up the offense because they're it, – it, if, if the Titans find themselves in that situation, it's going to be like a nine, ten-year pro, right? A six-year pro. So there's going to be no concern about learning the offense. Exactly. So that's what I think <clears> – it's tough. Malik Willis is in a tough spot this year. All right, moving on. Elijah Molden. Right now, penciled in as your starting safety. Why is it a make-or-break year for Molden? Well, we're really highlighting how bad that 2021 draft class was. <laughs> I think it's a make-or-break year for freaking all of them. But yeah. uh, a make-or-break year because, again, final year of his contract. Same thing with Radins and Weaver that we talked about a little earlier. What role is he going to play TBD, right? Like he, he made the switch to safety last year. It sounds like he's probably still going to be a safety slash just hybrid number three safety occasional nickel but he's not going to be a pure cornerback through and through i think those days are over it's a hybrid rotational whatever you want to call it more so is a safety uh i we still both think they're going to go out and sign another safety maybe again this episode ages poorly maybe they sign one while i'm i'm off and we didn't record but uh, if they do, though, we'll have an emergency pod ready to go. That I'll, I'll get up for if uh, if there's a safety sign. We're yeah. going to have an emergency reaction pod for sure. But with Molden, it's uh, almost like Weaver, right? You think there might be some opportunity here for him, although we're so confident they're going to sign a veteran safety. Uh, but still, if he's your number three safety, if he gets into like a rotation at corner because he's a hybrid, then there's going to be a chance for him to extend his NFL career here. I feel like Elijah Molden is probably not a Tennessee Titan next year. I feel like there are very few scenarios yeah, that I give him fair. enough opportunity 
to prove why he should be re-signed here versus pulling like a Dane Crookshank, where even if he gets to play a little bit here and there, someone else is going to identify a, a slightly larger role for him the way that Rand Carthon did with Daniel Brunskill and Aziz Alshire and like said, you guys were backups, but you can come be starters on our team. I feel like it's either that route for Elijah Molden or it's that he just doesn't get signed at all and, as a backup or special teamer instead. You know, like those are the... So I feel like this is probably his last year in Tennessee regardless. Yeah, and I try to learn my lesson every year. I'm about to say something really grim, but like I, I gotta take my own advice. Stop falling in love with really smart, fun draft prospects that are unathletic and have short arms. Yeah. Because I interviewed Elijah Molden that year. He was one of my favorite interviews. I did. He's one of the smartest football players I've ever spoken to. Ever. Wow. Okay. And the tape was unbelievable at Washington. Why? Because the football IQ was off the charts. Didn't we off have his charts? Didn't we have his dad on our podcast once? Yes, we did. I think. <laughs> football IQ off the why did we have I don't even remember why. <laughs> like, should we have like someone else's dad this year? We like, should have Will Levis's dad tell us some stories about Will. We should have Will. Like any, any like let's bring on uh, uh, Malik Willis's dad. Let's bring on Dylan Radens's dad. Maybe not, not after they listen to this episode, but <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, no, like he was so smart, the football IQ, but, but, but he was not athletic and he's got short arms and the deficiencies, it's the grim reality. We all want to root for the underdog and sometimes we see it happen, but it's a big fast man's game. Yeah. All right. Next guy on the list, uh, Chig Aconquo. Why is he this on the make? Why, this was this my was idea, idea, but why is he on the make or break list? Well, I'll tell you and why. You're going to throw it to me. No, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Look, he's going into his third season. A lot of times with tight ends, like they don't even crack the field till their third season. Now, I feel like that is changing a little bit recently with guys like Sam Laporta, Dalton Kincaid, and all these all these players that have come into the league and just taken it by storm. But typically, like traditionally, it takes tight ends two to three years to even find their place on the football field. And Chig has been starting since he was a rookie. Well, semi-starting, splitting time as a starter since he was a rookie. But I think that... There is that, I mentioned this a couple episodes ago, Mike Herndon has the Josh Wiley over Chigaconquo take brewing. Look, Chigaconquo as a rookie was one of the most efficient guys in terms of yards per reception, yards per route run, yards after catch. His volume saw an increase in his second year and his efficiency saw a major decrease, decline, like drop off of epic proportions level. He, speaking of drop offs, he suffered from drops a lot last year. I think this season, if he doesn't prove that he is the tight end one on this Titans roster, like if he doesn't outproduce Josh Wiley this year, that is a really bad sign for his career going forward as a tight end one in this league because he's not your typical inline guy who's going to have a role no matter what he does in the passing game because of his blocking ability. Like he's just not that guy. He's not that body type. Um, so he's got to prove that he can be a pass catcher first in this league I think he will. Like, I have no, I don't have, I'm not doubting his abilities on this team. But I do think that Mike's got that take brewing that there is a chance that Josh Wiley supplants Chig as the tight end one. And if that does happen, I just don't think it bodes well for where Chig's going to go the rest of his career, like what kind of role he's going to have. Now, I say all that, but I will still say, I think Chig does lead the tight ends in receiving this year. I think that he does have more of a year that looks closer to his rookie season, especially given the Brian Callahan offense. Now, Callahan's offense haven't always emphasized the tight end, so that is one area to watch out for. But just in terms yeah. of the fact that they're going to pass the ball so much more, the passing volume is naturally going to lift everyone's production in the passing game, Chig Conquo included. So I think he will end up having that make year and not the break year, but I still think it is, like it still qualifies to me as a make-or-break season. And I get where you're coming from, and I think I, I do get it. And it's fair to put him on this list now that you've made your argument because to a degree, maybe he's also fortunate that they didn't upgrade this position Agreed. in the offseason, right? Like, they, they could have gone I – mean, we talked about drafting Brock Bowers for so long and all, all this other nonsense, right? So it's like he's got opportunity here still because it's him, Josh Wiley, and probably Nick Vanett, we think, or however you pronounce Vanette. his name. but. Vanet. Vanet. Is it like French? Is it no, like it's not song? French. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Nick Vanet or Vanet, whatever it is. But um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is opportunity. But you're right. Like if he doesn't, if he has a repeat of the sophomore year, then they probably are investing some capital in tight end next year. Right. right? 
or if he gets supplanted by Josh Wiley this year, then Josh Wiley is the unquestioned number one in 2025. Right. So it's a very, it's very much a, the trail on Burks, the rate, the we, the NPF, very obvious make or break years. I agree with your take that this is a uh, an underrated make or break year for Chig. Thank you. All right. We are at 39 minutes, so we're going to breeze through the last three here. The next two are hyphenated or slash in between them. So Hassan Haskins slash Julius Chestnut, you put these guys on the list. Why'd you do it? Well, final opportunity probably for one of them to be the RB3. Look, uh, make or break, none of these guys are starting caliber players. They're not pushing Tajay Spears or Tony Pollard. Don't right. even think about it. But one of them's probably going to be the RB3 this year. And the one that isn't, uh, it's they're in danger, right? Their NFL yeah. career is probably in danger, right? So, look, they've stuck by Hassan Haskins through his, you know, alleged off-field situation. They're obviously giving him another chance. Was a really good special teams player in his rookie. He's now back with the team off the commissioner's exempt list. He's got a shot, clearly. Julius Chestnut, two straight years as an underdog, making the initial 53-man roster. Not a lot of regular season play time, but he can play on special teams, I think he even returned kicks once upon a time. So there's a chance for both these guys. Both of them are going to be facing more competition than ever before. Titans bring in three undrafted running backs. That's a ton of them. Jabari Small from the University of Tennessee, Dylan Johnson from Washington, and Jordan Bartell, Jordan Terrell, I think it is, from Barton College. Yeah, certainly a, the guy who was uber productive. The Julius Chestnut out of Sacred Heart, if you will, right. in 2021, right? So never write them off, I guess, but... Uh, I, you know, Haskins, Chestnut, leaders in the clubhouse for RB3, final chance probably for one of them to claim that role and extend their career. Yeah, and they're both going to be trying to do it with a new coaching staff, so it's sort of a clean slate right. for every guy there. I think, as with a lot of depth positions on offense and defense, whoever can perform the best on special teams is probably going to win that role, and that might mean Hassan Haskins is the early leader for it, but we'll see how all that shakes out. All right, last guy on the list. We will close out the 2021 draft class with our final make or break player here. Before we do, let me just, can I just run through the 2021 draft class real quick? First oh, round, first round, Caleb Farley. That is our final make or break player here that we're about to discuss. Second round, Dylan Radins on this list. Third round, Monty Rice, a New Orleans Saint now. I bet you didn't even know what team he played for, did you? Did you? I did not know he was with the Saints. Me neither. I had to look that up before we started. Uh, <laughs> other third round pick, Elijah Molden. He's on this list. Fourth round pick, Des Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Bro, oh, Amon Ross St. Board was Amon Ross St. Brown was on the board. Other fourth round I pick forgot Dez was in that draft too. <laughs> Other fourth round pick Rashad Weaver on this list. Sixth round pick Racy McMath. I think he's with the Cowboys. And the other sixth round pick Brady Breeze, not even in the NFL. So either so every guy from the 2021 draft class is either on the make or break list this year, or they're not even on the Titans anymore. So anyway, Caleb Farley, make or break year. Look, the best case scenario for Caleb Farley this year is that he's cornerback four and that's if he beats out Eric Garor, Trey Avery and anyone else competing Jarvis Brownlee Jr. anyone else competing for that fourth cornerback spot I think most likely his bet his actual best case scenario is that he's like cornerback seven I think this is yeah. I mean look before we go too deep on this I do want to put just like a sentiment out there that I feel deeply for Caleb Farley and everything he's been through in his life because it has been it has been rough. I mean, not just what happened to him on the field with injury, but the situation with his father and the house exploding and like there is some real tragedy. His mother passed away a little before the draft and right. really hurt him has affected him as well. And exactly. I mean, there has been some real tragedy in this young man's life and my heart goes out to him for that. But talking about him as a football player from that standpoint, Number one is the health. Can he even stay healthy? Even if he was able to play at a high level, could he do it for a long time before getting hurt? And then secondly is like the opportunity. The Titans massively upgraded this room. More upgrades here than any other position. That includes wide receiver and offensive line. Like this is the room that they attacked with the most ferocity here, adding Legereus Sneed and Cheeto Awuzie. So look, Caleb Farley is going to have a tough time even making the team, even proving that he belongs in this cornerback room for the regular season. That makes it a pretty big make or break year for a former first round pick who had so much potential and just couldn't stay on the field. Yeah, as much as I I, I feel for him, absolutely the sentiments. We've included him on this list almost out of, uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to say respect, but uh, a necessity because it's the final year of his contract, right? They declined the fifth year option, of course, but uh, for me, too far gone. I, I don't see any path whatsoever to this being salvaged, in yeah. all honesty, right? Like, I, I just don't see it. Even when, remember when he was on the field, like, 
uh, all the injuries, the surgeries, like looked like uh, he was 10 times less athletic than the player who was really athletic coming out of Virginia Tech. I think people have already forgotten how athletic he was, right? It just looked like a shell of himself athletically. So, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that so that's the situation. It's make or break year. So the full list, Traylon Burks, everyone agrees on that one. Dylan Radins, Rashad Weaver, NPF, those are the obvious ones. Obvious make or break years. Malik Willis, less obvious but still true. Elijah Molden, Chigga Konkbo, we explained why. Those RB3 guys, Hassan Haskins, Julius Chestnut, and Caleb Farley, all in make or break seasons. I would softly argue that Will Levis is in a make or break season too just because of everything the team has done to put him in position to succeed. If he doesn't succeed... They will be starting the search for a new quarterback, whether that's as soon as 2025 might- or sort of game planning to start making that move towards 2026. Like it, it won't last a long time for Levis in Tennessee if he struggles immensely this season. Now, if he struggles a little bit, then you say growing pains and give him another year. But it's somewhat of a make or break season for him, too. All right, Justin, any final parting words? We went 25 minutes longer than I thought we would on this episode. <laughs> No, I think that's a good point. All these guys make or break years for them, for sure. All right. Thank you to everyone for tuning in. Again, we prefer if you would watch us on YouTube. Go to Music City Audible YouTube channel and subscribe to the channel. Give this video a like, thumbs up, and turn on channel alerts so you get a notification every time we drop a new video. Again, the best way to help us grow, leave comments, as many comments as you can leave. If you've got multiple make or break candidates, drop them in the comments as separate comments, you know? Leave a comment for Traylon Burks. Leave a comment for Dylan Radins. Different comments, different algorithm boosting. We really appreciate you guys and all the support you give, so thank you. And thanks also to our sponsors, Sinkers Beverages in East Nashville, Bluegrass Beverages in Hendersonville. As I mentioned, you can go to sinkersbeverages.com or follow the link in this podcast description to join the in crowd. In crowd members get access to allocated wines and spirits, exclusive events, early access to barrel releases, and more. Plus, they're on Uber Eats. Just search Sinkers Beverages in Uber Eats, and you can have all the booze that you're looking for delivered straight to your door. All right, that'll do it for this one. We'll be back soon with more talking about this Titans roster. We might get into an episode about where the Titans secondary might rank, similar to how we did the Bill Callahan deep dive looking at where the Titans offensive line might rank. That was a suggestion by one of our viewers, subscribers, Spencer Smith. So we appreciate you, Spencer Smith, for dropping that comment about what you want us to talk about. Look, we're open to suggestions. If you guys want to hear us talk about something, let us know in the comments below, just like Spencer did. And I think we are going to attack this topic soon, Spencer. So stay tuned. Appreciate you. Appreciate all of you out there. Until then, though, you all stay safe and tighten up. A Broadway Sports Media Production.